I had to name 10 artists that I've ever been involved with. Rugby used to be in the top five. He's my most memorable artist. Bob Dylan was mild to this guy. He was this wandering spirit around the city. When he opened up and sang, he went, whoa, this guy's got it. We expected big things, and it did absolutely nothing. How many records do you think he sold in America? In America, six. Nobody had even heard of him. How can that be? How can that be? It's a bit of a mystery how the first copy of Cold Fact came to South Africa, but to us, it was one of the most famous records of all time. He was the soundtrack to our lives. Bigger than Elvis. Much bigger than Rolling Stones. Any revolution needs an answer. The message it had was be anti-establishment. The first opposition to apartheid, they were influenced by Rodriguez. Oh, wow. That uh, was a trailer for the Oscar-winning documentary Searching for Sugar Man. It chronicles two South Africans as they search for singer-songwriter Sixto Rodriguez, once called the greatest protest singer and songwriter that most people never heard of. Rodriguez released two albums in the 1970s that flopped in the U.S., but became massively successful in South Africa, where he was compared to such legends as Bob Dylan and Cat Stevens. The owner of a Cape Town record store said, quote, to many of us South Africans, he was the soundtrack to our lives. And here's the thing. Rodriguez appeared to have no idea of his success. He quit music and settled down in Detroit, started a family and made a living through manual labor. It wasn't until 1997 when one of his daughters discovered a website dedicated to him that Rodriguez learned of his success abroad. Rodriguez passed away on Tuesday at the age of 81. And joining us now is one of Sixto Rodriguez's daughters, Sandra Rodriguez Kennedy, along with the founder of Light in the Attic Records, Matt Sullivan, whose label reissued Rodriguez's albums. So, so Sandra, wow. it's it it is such it, it's always been such an extraordinary story. Uh, we're sorry, first of all, for the passing yeah. of your father, and certainly thinking about you and your family now. But we thought this would be a wonderful time to celebrate. Uh, his his remarkable life and legacy, uh, and and what he had, what he meant to South Africans fighting apartheid, all while he was basically a day laborer in Detroit. Tell us about that incredible life that your father lived, and what you're the proudest of. Um, I'm extremely proud of him for pursuing his musical career. Um, amidst, you know, people telling him work in auto plants or get a real job. And he just persevered as the artist that he is and has always been. And I knew from birth, I was born in 1964, and I knew from birth that he was a rock star. And I love the songs as much as his fans. And we have a lot of relationships, my father and I. We're business partners, we're musicians, we're friends, we're uh, politicals, we're activists. We're, uh, we're, he's my father. So um, he belongs to me as much as he belongs to the world and his global audience. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Much gratitude to everyone for their uh, well wishes and condolences and their outpouring of, of love. And I can feel it. It's yeah. a vibration. He vibed at a vibration of, of, of love and wisdom. And um, he shared that with us. So. I'm grateful for him, yeah. his words, the way his mind works. <laughs> Work. Yeah, Matt, yeah. Um, I, I, it, is, it is hard to fathom that he's working with people uh, who he, he said, hey, I got, you know, I used to be a musician. And I, ah, oh, come on, really, man? And there's that moment when he first plays... And you're, you're, you're seeing this thing build up, and you're like, come on, man, this can't be real. And then he steps out onto the stage in South Africa in 1998, and you look at the faces of the people. It's literally, it's literally like Elvis came back to life. There are people that were weeping and cheering. 
And he just stood on stage and they just cheered and kept screaming. And he was so humble and he said, thank you for keeping me alive. I have a feeling wow. that this extraordinary story and his music will stay alive for a long time. Talk about this extraordinary slice of not only rock history, but also of, of ending apartheid in South Africa. Yeah, it's incredible. His music was, you know, it was the soundtrack to the anti-apartheid movement uh, for people in South Africa. People say that his, you know, his records were as popular as you went in everyone's house and his records were as popular as a Simon and Garfunkel record or a Beatles Abbey Road record. Uh, and he didn't even know it. Um, it's just, uh, it's mind boggling. I mean, there's shards of, you know, his lyricism is like nobody. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling, the music that he wrote. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there in 1998 watching that footage and I'll watch it in the movie right now again for the 50th time. It makes me almost want to start crying because you see people's faces and you're right. It is like Elvis going back from the dead or the Beatles or, you know, and just seeing something, I mean, it gives me goosebumps. Uh, he was a remarkable person. Uh, his essence was just, and spirit uh, was like no one I've ever met in my life. I mean, he really changed my life in so many ways and shaped me and I think made me into a better person. And in you know, all of us are at Light in the Attic and everyone he met, uh, his music just will, it's definitely gonna carry on. I mean, he had such a strong spirit um, just such a strong spirit. It's just like, you know, undeniable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and Sandra, I've got to say, yes, him, him going back to South Africa and having this triumphant um, concert and, and this concert tour and, and, and re, re, renewed success, that was moving, but it wasn't as moving as what he did after, which is he <laughs> went back to Detroit, he lived in the same home, the money he gave, Rolling Stone said, he gave to friends and family members. He continued living an extraordinary, humble life, almost a monk-like life, and would just yeah. sit in that house. And there's that incredible scene with just him, an acoustic guitar, this really humble home he's living in, the snow quietly falling outside. It was almost like, you know, almost like a religious experience. It was, it's extraordinary. He, he stayed true to himself through it all, didn't he? That is correct, yes. He, he, um, he said he's not giving his money away. He said that he was investing in people. So um, he, would, he wanted economic freedom for people. He was very much a part of a civil rights movement, of the United Migrant Workers' plight, um, he, he, poverty, I won't glamorize poverty. Um, one of his shortcomings and one of his weaknesses was that he wouldn't ask for help. He, he would find mm. a way. Um, um, so I, I just figured that out now, you know, this is a holy time. <laughs> Grief is a holy time. I held his hand. I was, I'm his medical spiritual person in his life. And he would say, keep me alive when he was getting weak. Um, um, so we did everything and I was with him when he, uh, breathed his last breath and it was just very, very peaceful and very textbook the way a person, uh, uh takes up spirit. And so, um, now he's eternal mm -hmm. and he's gone to the hereafter and, um, he, he's spirit. So he's totally free. Sandra Rodriguez Kennedy and Matt Sullivan, thank you both so much for sharing part of this incredible legacy now uh, with us. And in honor of Rodriguez's legacy, his family will be putting on a concert this Saturday in Detroit at the Masonic Temple from noon to 11 p.m. The event will be free to the public.